My name is Maroon Bixen, and I'm going to be talking about how biomarkers play a critical role in the design of neuromodulation brain stimulation devices. And this lecture is very much based on an article uh, that I've posted on um, Neuromotic. This is, once again, the link to that article. There's also a link here uh, to, an, to a lecture I made on neuromodulation for pain and how that works which really applies a lot of these concepts uh, to the specific domain of, of, of pain control. Now, there's many types of neuromodulation, uh, and these range from things that need to be implanted, like DBS and SES, techniques that warrant going to the hospital because of their cost or complexity, such as TMS and ECT, and also wearable technology, so things that are battery-powered, um, can be carried around things like TDCS but what I'm going to be talking about today spans all these forms of neuromodulation also called brain stimulation uh, because it is really about the highest level principles of how we customize these therapies using biomarkers I need to start with uh, a clear definition of what we mean by neuromodulation dose. People tend to understand that with drugs, neuromodulation dose is what we are prescribed. It's what's in the pill and what we take. Um, what does neuromodulation dose mean as far as um, um, its therapy? Well, it's the same thing as drugs. It is what we are prescribed. It is what is reproduced uh, from patient to patient in, in, in a clinical trial. And for neuromodulation, that specifically means all the aspects of the technology and how it's programmed that determine how energy is delivered to the body. And when it's uh, electrical stimulation, it's really how electricity is delivered to the body. Now that's a, a bit of a, of a wordy definition, but it actually uh, reduces to just a couple very simple principles. The first aspect of neuromodulation dose is where you place the electrodes. Are they placed on the forehead or on the spinal cord? And also how big they are and what shape they are. So they might be uh, one centimeter square disc electrodes uh, and they're placed somewhere over the spinal cord. That is the first aspect of neuromodulation dose. The second and final aspect of neuromodulation dose is the waveform that is played to the electrodes by the stimulation device and therefore played into the body. So the neuromodulation device, it could be an, an IPG, it could be a, a wearable or benchtop device, is basically a function generator that plays a waveform that travels down the wire, down the leads, into the electrodes, and where it gets to the electrodes, it then crosses into the body. So the waveform that is specified by the device is the waveform that the body is exposed to. So we might talk about um, um, 100 hertz pulse stimulation with an intensity of one milliamp. And that's it. Where we put the electrodes and the waveform that we play to them together fully define neuromodulation dose. Um, the position of the electrodes has a very profound effect on where in the body the current flows. If I put an electrode on my uh, right hand, I will feel tingling on my right hand and not on my left hand. If I put an electrode um, over a segment of my spinal cord, that segment of the spinal cord will be preferentially stimulated. So that's a simple way to think about why electrode position matters. The intensity and waveform that we play in has a very profound effect on how the neurons in that part of the body respond. So for example, if we're playing 100 hertz stimulation, um, I'm using that term playing, right? We're applying 100 hertz stimulation. We might be driving neurons at 100 hertz, leading to various secondary consequences. And those consequences can be rather complicated and nuanced, but irrespective of that, it starts with the waveform. The waveform governs how these cells respond, whether their function is increased, decreased, whether we enhance plasticity, uh, and so on. Now, there's a couple corollaries uh, to this sort of very precise definition of neuromodulation dose. If two devices produce the same dose, as far as the body's response, they are indistinguishable. If one is orange and made by company A, and one is purple and made by company B, the body doesn't know the difference because the energy that's coming into the body, the electrical stimulation, is exactly the same. 
And conversely, if you want to create a new neuromodulation device, one that does something that previous devices did not do, you must change the dose. You must change either where you place the electrodes or some aspect of the waveform that you're playing, like you go from 100 hertz to 1000 hertz. That's it. Those are the only levers we have to pull in neuromodulation design. Now, people who work in neuromodulation will say, oh, wait, that's oversimplification. There are clearly other aspects of the technology that are extremely important to control. Usability features, battery life, um, factors that may affect safety, uh, and so on. And absolutely these features do exist and absolutely they are important and pivotal to the advancement of technology, but I'm putting them separate from neuromodulation dose because these are things that don't directly influence the energy that's put into the body and how the body responds, though they might actually have a huge influence on the usability or acceptability of a, of a product. The final idea to keep in mind here is that in neuromodulation, every device can provide many doses because the electrodes attached to the device could be put in different locations. And the waveform put by the device can be programmed. A device doesn't just play one waveform. It might play 100 hertz or 110 hertz. It might provide a 1 milliamp of stimulation or it might provide 2 milliamps of stimulation. And so there's quite a range of waveforms that a device can play. And this is why every device is programmable. So it's not like a drug where you get it and it's set. In the case of neuromodulation, the product itself has many possible doses built into it. And the task of the person using the device is to pick the right dose. Now, I already mentioned waveform, right, is, is part of what's being played from the device. There are many, many variations of waveform, and I can point you to this reference, and there are others that describe these permutations, the number of pulses per second, the shape of the pulses, whether they're patterned in particular ways, there's even non-pulsed base stimulation. And the only point uh, I wanna draw for the purpose here is that a single device can provide many, many different options of waveform. Perhaps no single device can provide all waveforms, but every neuromodulation device can provide multiple, multiple waveforms. So that, that means that the device is, is, is packaged with many waveform sets to, to pick from. Now, many talks on neuromodulation, including ones that I give, really drill down on waveform. And they'll say, look, this particular waveform is so special because it leads to these particular neurophysiological responses, and that is great for this particular disorder. But other than this slide, I'm actually not going to be saying more about waveform here because the principles that I'm going to be talking about um, will, will apply to all aspects of, of technology and all aspects of, of waveform selection. So this is the most important slide uh, of this talk. Uh, we have a neuromodulation device. It is a piece of equipment, all right? And it is going to provide a particular neuromodulation dose, that is the electrode configuration and the waveform to the patient. And that neuromodulation dose applied to the patient will determine the outcomes. That is the only thing that will drive the, the clinical behavioral cognitive outcome. However, we understand that the neuromodulation device comes programmed or features the ability to select from many possible neuromodulation doses. So I define a term called dose instructions. Dose instructions is the manual that comes with the device or the the tips, the, the, you know, the, the training that tells the operator how to pick the right dose because you've got a lot of doses to pick from. And so you can't have a device just put out there. The device must come with some form of instructions that explain this is how you're going to select the, the dose for this particular patient depending on what you want to achieve. All right. So again, very important. You have neuromodulation devices with multiple dose options. And the operator, right, or the user at any given time needs to just try one. You can only try one at a time. Now, here's the catch. The same neuromodulation dose applied to a different patient or even the same patient at a different time may produce a different outcome. Now, why is that? Well, the simple answer is because one, we're built differently. Our anatomy is different, right? And so again, applying the same dose to very different shaped anatomies will not produce the same energy flow patterns in the body. And also our neurophysiology is very different. 
right? The way uh, my spinal cord circuitry works is gonna be different than the way your spinal cord circuitry works. And those things may also be uh, disease dependent or a disease state dependent. So it is a, it is a moving target. And the way a neuromodulation dose will affect a person depends on the anatomy and on this underlying brain neurophysiological state. And that's why the same dose can lead to very different outcomes, all right? Our solution in neuromodulation, and this is all neuromodulation essentially, is to give different doses to different patients or, 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 or different doses to the same patient at different times with the notion that there's a better way to do things, a way to adjust dose to the patient and the time in order to get the desired outcomes. And this is the essential problem in neuromodulation. It is also the essential opportunity because it is something that the technology and the operators take advantage of. This is one way to think about what neuromodulation design is. Neuromodulation design is not just the creation of the devices, but the packaging of them with a label, with instructions that tell you how to adjust the waveform. That's why dose instructions are so important and why in my conception, you cannot think of a neuromodulation device technology without also thinking about the associated dose instructions. Okay, so how do we do that? What, what is the basis principle of basic ideas of how, of how um, these dose instructions might work? Well, very simplistically, right? Like this, and I'm saying reducing variability, meaning we want to produce consistent outcomes across individuals. So we start with the technology, we apply a dose, and we have that individual's brain, physiological anatomy at that time, uh, and their physiological state. And that will lead to specific response. Now, if we're happy with the response, we're happy with what we see, then we leave the dose the way it is. Don't change the dose, right? Don't tune the dose, don't adjust anything, it's good. If we are not happy with the response, we're not getting the benefits we want, or perhaps there are unacceptable side effects, right? Then we say, no, we're not happy, and now we're going to adjust the dose, right? Which is just the um, position, the location of the electrodes, and then the type of waveform and its intensity. Again, those are the only levers we have to pull. So that's it. And now we introduce biomarkers. Now, we may look at the person's uh, self-reported mood state, their behavioral state, what they're telling us about their side effects, and we may use that for dose tuning. So that's what I'm calling clinical endpoints, all right? The, the end game of neuromodulation. But more often than not, we don't use that. We rely on something else, and these are biomarkers. Now, I'm gonna be defining biomarkers here and in this, um, uh, the linked to document as everything else other than clinical endpoints that we use in this dose titration loop. And so I'm gonna be spending the rest of this talk explaining what are these biomarkers and how are, um, how are they used. But what I want you to, get away, to take, get, get away from this slide is that to the extent that neuromodulation must be tuned to an individual, and that is part of neuromodulation device design, thinking about biomarkers is essential. Uh, to neuromodulation design. And so I'm gonna be discussing about the type of biomarkers that we use, you know, and, and then the how and the why sort of come, come together. Now, in a slide, this is how neuromodulation works, and it's not the point of my talk here, but you know, this is everything you need to know, right? With, without any of the necessary details. We start with a device, a physical uh, device, and these come in all, in all shapes and sizes. And all these devices are programmable. Maybe there are knobs, maybe there's an app. The device combined with how we program it leads to a dose. That dose is applied to the body or to the brain, and that generates energy inside the body. In the case of electrical stimulation, it generates an electrical flow pattern through the body. Now the, there's electricity flowing inside the body and where that electricity is in its waveform is governed by the dose. This then leads to a change in the body's response, right? We're stimulating the body. The neurons, other cells in the body will respond to the energy, to the electricity. And so their behavior will change. In this case, I'm just randomly showing a, a unit recording from a neuron and it starts to fire more 
uh, when the stimulation is turned on between the arrows. Uh, and this will often be described as sort of the mechanism of therapy. These short-term changes will lead to more durable changes. And this is an important distinction. The difference is that when we turn off the stimulation, the short-term changes go away, but the durable ones stay. So for example, if you're getting treatment for one hour a day, uh, you want that benefit to stay for the remaining 23. Or if you're getting treatment for one week, you want that benefit to stay for many weeks afterwards. So many forms of neuromodulation, including by the way, those that are on chronically, tonically, do not, not simply produce short-term changes, but produce more durable changes. And again, we can tell they're durable because when we turn off the stimulation, they're still there. And then finally, it is these durable changes that underpin these durable changes in physiology and, and neuronal function that underpin the cognitive, the behavioral, whatever clinical endpoints that we're interested in. Okay, so that's how neuromodulation works in a highly reduced slide. Now, I wanna go back to the concept of dose tuning, right? So we have the same pathway from device to energy to short-term changes to durable changes to cognitive uh, behavioral changes, and we can use these clinical endpoints for dose tuning. But there's a problem with doing that. And the problem is that these outcomes are often hard to assess and worse than that, they're slow. So let's say we're using neuromodulation to treat depression, but it may be hard uh, on any given day to quantify exactly uh, what a person is going through. And moreover, you know, when we're applying neuromodulation, the effects aren't like that. The effects can take days or even weeks to build. So think about it, you're applying one dose one shot on goal, and now you have to wait weeks or months to see if it works or not, all right? And during that time, this person is suffering. And then, after all that, you say, okay, didn't work. I'm gonna learn from that experience. I'm gonna go back through the loop again. I have so many doses to try, all right? I'm just gonna pick another one out of a thousand options. And now I have to wait months again. What are your chances of picking that really optimal dose out of thousands or more options when you only get one shot every few months. And, and during that time, who knows, maybe the patient, the patient's state has changed and they need an updated dose anyways. A lot of things are happening. And so we ideally might do this, but it ends up being practically um, rarely relied on primarily because it's so slow. Instead, what we can do is we can look at the short-term changes in the body and we can use that as a biomarker to adjust dose. Now I'm gonna be calling this the type two biomarker. You can anticipate there'll be a type one and, and type three as well. But a type two biomarker is a measure of a short-term, an acute, an immediate change in the body in response to neuromodulation. Now, what are kind of examples of type two biomarkers, right? Um, a great example would be TENS, or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. You can get this at a pharmacy for your pain. You buy it. The dose instructions say, put it over the part of the body that hurts, okay? And then adjust the knobs, including the intensity, until the point that you feel tingling over the part of the body. Why does tingling matter? Well, it's based on this theory of pain control that if you rub it, it feels better, also called gait control. So the TENS is producing a tingling sensation. This is a short-term effect, but that tingling sensation will then trigger processes that will reduce your pain. Now think about it, the tingling is not the goal of the therapy. This is not a tingling produced device. It's not its essence. The essence is to control pain, but the tingling is a way to adjust the dose in such a way that we activate the therapeutic mechanism, tingling, and once we hold this, we will eventually get the therapeutic benefit. So we are adjusting the TENS device, the dose instructions are very explicit, to produce paresthesia, tingling, as a way to get to this endpoint. There are many other examples. There may be um, interventions uh, for people who have suffered um, um, some type of injury, uh, that they require now rehabilitation and there are some neuromodulation technologies that will adjust the dose uh, based on doing something like producing a, a, a muscle twitch um, uh, as a way to quickly titrate a very large parameter space uh, even though that muscle twitch is not the endpoint. Um, yet another example might be looking at brain oscillation. So now you're, you're taking the, the stimulation technology, 
you're recording brain oscillations, not because that's the goal of the therapy itself, but because you believe that if I adjust the dose in such a way, up, down, increase the frequency, in such a way that the oscillations change, and then I hold it, I will then over time produce these more durable and lasting changes that will lead to the cognitive income, uh, cognitive or clinical endpoint benefit. And again, the, the um, oh, and another example would be electroconvulsive therapy for um, depression, uh, a very uh, established treatment for severe refractory depression. What is done? The dose is adjusted, right? The person is um, uh, unconscious, the, the dose is adjusted, um, they're, un, they're under anesthesia, until such point as you produce a seizure, that's your therapy dose. The seizure is produced and then the person um, uh, wake up, wakes, wakes up and over time um, their symptoms improve. The seizure is considered to be a mechanism of action. It's something that's very tangible to titrate to in that session, right? But it's clearly not the goal of the treatment. It is a biomarker. It's a means to an end. And there's many other examples. And um, again, what I would say is for it to be a type 2 biomarker, the key feature is that when you turn off the stimulation, that biomarker goes back to the way it was, right? When you turn off the TENS device, the tingling needs to go away. It is a short-term change, fast on, fast off, but useful for exactly that reason. And it allows us to kind of do an initial quick arounds on the loop before locking it in and waiting for the more durable changes. Now, the other types of biomarkers are actually much less common. A type three biomarker, which I'll describe briefly here, but please, um, you can look at the article for much more details, is something that I call a clinical surrogate. It is something that moves along uh, with the clinical endpoint. So let's say we had a way to uh, measure the brain and know exactly how depressed someone is. And as they become more depressed, this marker goes up. And as they become less depressed, this marker goes down. So now instead of asking them how they feel necessarily, uh, we can measure this, this um, biomarker and use it in the loop. Now the key difference between the type three and the type two is when we turn off stimulation, uh, we would predict that so long as the person continues to feel better, the type three biomarker would remain um, in its in its in this additional state, right? Because it's it's a durable biomarker. It, it tracks the clinical endpoint even when we don't have stimulation. As the person's behavioral symptoms are changing, the type three biomarker will move along with it. So you see, there's a difference here in, in how we think about it. And finally, a type one biomarker, just very briefly, would be to measure the energy in the body directly. So this is an instant on, instant off effect. We know that the energy is part of this pathway, right? It's part of this cascade. And because the energy can be measured and because it can be uh, measured instantly and the dose adjusted to get the energy to where we need it to be, it is another possible candidate. Having said that, really, the type two uh, is what um, you're going to be seeing the most of in, in neuromodulation. But to be comprehensive, I need to define these three types. And I want to mention, you know, there's a lot of other literature out there talking about what biomarkers are, uh, classifying them. And the approach I've done here, I think, is is in some ways, you know, respecting what was done before, but is unique. So you're not going to see these types in the literature uh, or this term responsive biomarker. Now, what do I mean by a responsive biomarker? I mean, it changes with stimulation. All of these change with stimulation. That's the whole principle of it, right? We're applying a particular dose we're looking at how these biomarkers respond. And then accordingly, we are then updating the dose, right? So there, there was there. And again, I want to mention these are this is terminology that I've, I've tried to develop and have tried to develop terminology that is very um, consistent and complete as far as covering um, all forms of neuromodulation. But in so doing, I realized something was missing. You see, there are responsive biomarkers, but there are also non-responsive biomarkers, and I'm going to be calling these predictive biomarkers. Simply put, predictive biomarkers are things that we use to adjust the dose, okay, so there are biomarkers, but we don't assume that they change with stimulation. Okay, examples are always easy to make the, the case. For example, what if we're measuring someone's brain activity, and we're looking at the level of um, oscillations, and we're saying whenever the oscillations go above a certain point, trigger the stimulation, turn it on. 
However, we don't actually look or care if the oscillations change with stimulation. We're using the oscillations as a way to control timing, in this case to gate the, the timing of stimulation, but not necessarily to, to change the oscillations. There's other examples as well. There's breathing gated stimulation or even uh, um, heart rate gated stimulation. So you breathe and when you breathe, the device detects it and then it applies the stimulation. The point of the neuromodulation is not to change breathing. It's not to change cardiac function. It's just using that information for timing purposes. Hence, it is a predictive biomarker. Another type of predictive biomarker, again, my own classification, is something that I call playback. So for example, we might be recording brain activity and identifying a brain region that we consider to have pathological activity, and then we apply stimulation back to that region, right? Or maybe we are recording um, the frequency of, of brain oscillations at a particular region, and then we apply stimulation at that same frequency back to that same brain region. But the key thing here for this to be responsive is this approach is agnostic to whether those oscillations actually change. Now maybe they do, maybe they don't, but for the purpose of dose instructions, the manual that comes with the device, we're not looking. We looked initially, we looked at the frequency initially in order to decide what frequency we should stimulate at, but once we start stimulating, the dose instructions um, become agnostic to it. And so this, this is a distinction, first of all, with a difference because the dose instructions are different. And, and even though I guess, you know, you gotta think about it a little bit, there, there's an ambiguity here. Either you have dose instructions that look to see if the biomarker changes, or you have dose instructions that are not based on whether the biomarker changes. And this leads to a clear um, classification. Now there's a bit uh, of, of nuance, there always is. In neuromodulation, there's also something called, I'm calling, a evoked predictive biomarker. Let me give you an example. Transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression. The way the procedure starts is, a pulse is applied over the motor cortex to produce a finger twitch. And the amplitude of stimulation is adjusted in order to produce a sufficient finger twitch. Then, the stimulator is moved forward to the frontal region, and the waveform is in fact changed. It's reduced, the frequency is increased, and then therapy is applied. During therapy, the stimulation is not being applied to the motor cortex, it's being applied frontally in a different way, and there's no motor twitch. So we see that in the process of tuning the dose, in the dose instructions, we used a test dose to evoke a short-term response, and then that information informed a different therapy dose. Now this happens a lot in neuromodulation, and again, it's a little bit tricky to think about because it's like, well, hold on, on the one hand, this is a biomarker that responds to stimulation, but the other hand, the, the biomarker doesn't change with the therapeutic stimulation, so I need to distinguish between a test dose here and a therapy dose, and again, I, I will refer you to the document below which really expands on this in more detail. And finally, in order to be very comprehensive, and again, I wanted a system that covered all of neuromodulation and covered it consistently, um, uh, I suggested that there a type of predictive biomarker would be neuronavigation. Again, neuro neuronavigation is typically maybe not called a biomarker, but what is happening with neuronavigation? We are measuring some, tip, we would be going to be measuring something about the body. We're going to be imaging the brain imaging the spinal cord, we're going to be taking that imaged information and we're going to be using it to try to figure out what kind of dose we should give. Now the anatomy does not change with stimulation. That's not what we're thinking. So that's why it's a predictive biomarker. It is, it is a, a, a measurement from an individual that is used to individualize dose, but it does not itself change with stimulation. And sometimes what we do is in addition to imaging the body, we also image the position of the device relative to the body. And so we can adjust things relative to one another. That's what we call neuronavigation devices. And so in my classification scheme here, uh, neuronavigation devices fall under predictive uh, biomarkers uh, of the neuronavigation type. And as, as I've shown you here, in each case where I've defined a type of biomarker, I also put it in the context of a particular kind of dose instruction loop. And so the point is that biomarkers um, 
are each associated with a type of dose instructions, which is a loop. Uh, and again, that will be described a lot more in the article below. So I want to go through one example. And the point of this example, it's not the, exa the particular example is not important, is to show this general idea that it's okay to be unsure uh, about the type of biomarkers we have. It, it's fact, it's almost unavoidable. Let's say, for example, we're using deep brain stimulation uh, to treat depression, and we've guessed that the level of, of beta oscillations in someone's brain uh, marks up how, they press, how depressed they are. And so what we're doing is we're stimulating the person to get the beta oscillations from an unhealthy depressed level to a healthy depressed level. And this is simply a, a type one responsive biomarker. The beta oscillations are a surrogate for the disease. Th th their nature determines whether or not you have depression or not. And so when we treat the beta oscillations to get them to where they need to be, so will the uh, symptoms be treated. And if we turn off the stimulation and your beta oscillations stay where they need to stay, so will your mood, right? So it's durable. All right, however, what if we do something a bit differently? What if we find out that when we stimulate, um, um, the beta oscillations change, but when we turn off the stimulation, they go back to the way they were. Now the mood slowly improves over time after the stimulation is turned off. So think about it, okay, the stimulation is producing an acute change in oscillations, but as soon as the stimulation is turned off, the oscillations go back to the way they were. But over time, right, even though the oscillations are back to where they were, the symptoms improve. So this is a responsive biomarker of type two. If we were designing technology in this way, if this was our principle of neuromodulation design, we would not be looking for a biomarker that changes in a durable way. We would be looking for a biomarker spe specifically that changes acutely. And that's how we would design dose instructions. Now, um, what if uh, we're recording uh, beta oscillations from a person and based on the location of the oscillations, maybe their frequency, we decide what dose to apply. So we're gonna apply stimulation to where the beta oscillations are maximum uh, at the frequency of that individual beta oscillation. But when we do this in our dose instructions, we don't actually look to see whether the beta oscillations change or not. They may or may not, but for the purpose of dose instructions, we are agnostic to this fact. We don't care. It is then a predictive biomarker, right? And it is an evoked predictive biomarker. Now, if suddenly we say, hold on, I want to look at the biomarker. I do want to see if it changes or not. And based on that, I, I may adjust my dose. Then it switches to a responsive biomarker. Um, if we record the oscillations again and beta oscillations, you know, depending on the individual uh, beta, we apply stimulation back to that person at exactly that frequency, right? Uh, and we think that that's going to be more effective at changing the oscillations, but we don't actually look. We don't actually measure in that person, in that person's dose instructions, whether the oscillations change or not. It is a playback type. If we measure and then make decisions accordingly, uh, it comes across as responsive. Now you'll often see computational models used in neuromodulation, in neuromodulation design, or even in the actual programmers themselves. How does that all fit in? Based on my scheme, it, it depends. It, it starts first with deciding what kind of biomarker you're looking at. And then the computational models are just the signal processing we're using to help get from that biomarker to the dose. So computational models can fit with any uh, of the schemes I've just described here, and they don't really define the scheme at all. It's just like math, right? It's just math that we're doing in the loop, but they don't uh, impact the structure of the loops directly. Okay, a couple more ideas. This is the main slide I told you, the most important slide. We have our device, which has multiple uh, doses built into it. We pick one, that dose is applied to a patient or a group of patients, and then we look at the outcomes. Let's say things work, right? We have a device, dose instructions, we set it up, we applied a particular dose, and the patient or the group of patients responded wonderfully. What did we prove? Did we prove that the theory behind it all, right, like the mechanism of action, uh, did we prove that that was right? Or did we prove that the device and the dose instructions work, but maybe we don't actually know why? And what I want to suggest to you is that in fact, that's the only thing we can be sure about. 
When we test a device and the associated dose instructions, what we validate is the device and the associated dose instructions. And this is true even when we're using a biomarker of the second type. So we're saying, okay, I have a, I have a dose instructions where I'm measuring something that I think is the mechanism action. I'm using that in my loop, right? Things worked out beautifully. I must have been right, right? I mean, how could it have worked if my theory wasn't right? And this is a, a, a important idea. Again, I would refer you to the full description of it in, in, in this article below, but it turns out no, because it might have worked for different reasons. You might have had the theory wrong, but by accident, you got to the right device and dose instructions. And if later on you realize that the theory was different, oh, I wasn't stimulating this, I was really stimulating this, that doesn't make the device and dose instructions any different. So you can say, well, why does mechanism matter at all? Well, it absolutely matters because mechanism is how we come up with the device and the dose instructions to begin with. We're not just like randomly putting electrodes and waveforms together. We need a basis to drive the design. And so, and so mechanisms, theory must be there as the basis to design the device and the associated dose instructions. Like I said, it can't go separate, but then that goes out into the real world and whether it works or not, interestingly enough, doesn't directly imply whether the mechanism was right or whether the mechanism was wrong. So then this is my final slide. And again, there's a lot going on here. So I'll refer, you know, I'm summarizing it briefly. It's all in that document below. At the core here, we have the device technology and the dose instructions of hope I've convinced you. Those cannot be disassociated. Those are tested maybe on one subject, maybe in a clinical trial, maybe a large clinical experience, leading to a particular result. Successful or not, what that tells you directly is whether the technology and the dose instructions were good or not. Right? That's what it maps onto. Now, where did we initially come up with that device technology and dose instructions? Well, it was based on some kind of theory. I'm going to call this background mechanisms, right? It's in the background. We have some theories about how neurons respond, and we have theories about how electrodes should be one centimeter squared and not 1.5 centimeter squared, and that 100 hertz is better than 101 hertz, based on all this kind of theory. And we, we, we took that theory and we loaded that into the device and the technology, right, and the dose instructions. The technology and the dose instructions are the physical embodiment of the mechanisms. But once it's physically embodied, mechanisms are left behind and we're just testing that. Still, if the clinical trial is successful, we might think that our background mechanism theories were right. But in fact, they may not be right. right? And that is something I, I, I discuss in more detail, including on the associated talk uh, that I linked to initially on neuromodulation for pain, where I explain very clearly why uh, mechanisms have a way of doing a bit of a switcheroo on us, and we have to keep our eyes on the fact that we are only testing technology and dose instructions. Now, the background mechanisms include how we think neuromodulation works, and everything else that made it, that went to creating the technology. What we know about batteries, what we know about biocompatibility, uh, what we know about user preferences. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. And in fact, we're constantly building up our background mechanisms. We're constantly getting more and more insight. But here's the key. If, if you come up with more and more insight, but you don't change the technology or the dose instructions, clinical outcomes are not going to vary. Put another way, the, the, the basic science that matters, the new background knowledge that matters, however we gained it, whether we gained it from clinical trials or doing preclinical work or computational modeling, the only type of background knowledge that matters from a, a application perspective, from the perspective of reducing suffering, is the type that translates into a new technology um, or new dose instructions. Like if there's an existing dose technology device out there and people think it works by mechanism A, and then you realize that it works by mechanism B, and then people say, oh, interesting, should I change the device? And you say, no, 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 don't change the device at all. I'm just telling you that it's mechanism B and not A. You haven't actually impacted the um, clinical experience using the device because you didn't change anything else. And so at a, at a very big picture level, you can see how I'm saying, okay, therapies are propagating forward. Problems, meaning when things don't work, lessons learned, broadly pro propagate back, and that's summarized here.
Finally, last slide, to put everything in perspective, this is the core of it. Device technology, doses, right? Individual changing, individual anatomy, individual brain state, leading to outcomes, but we are reading things pre-outcome in order to drive a loop, and I've, disca I've disca described specific types of biomarkers with specific types of associated loops. Now, when you talk about, uh, uh, there's always gonna be inclusion, exclusion, uh, criteria um, in any intervention. To some extent, those are part of dose instructions. This person qualifies, this does not. However, uh, if those are not actually affecting the selection of dose, they don't qualify, in my definition, uh, as a biomarker. And one reason for that is often inclusion and exclusion are not based on, on particular... Um, impl they're based on reasons unrelated to whether the thing works or not. Like, for example, you may exclude uh, individuals who are, are pregnant, and it's not because the device may or may not work for them, it's simply because as part of the regulatory submission process, uh, they were never included, and so now they are excluded. So that's why I would be a little bit careful about putting inclusion and exclusion as, as potentially outside the box. Now, we often, after running a trial, we collect data on heart rate, uh, blood drawn markers, fMRI, and we use all that information. Now. When this is done after the fact, meaning when we collect all this information and we sort of retro predict uh, or try to regress uh, what mattered, like um, having high beta oscillations predicted that you would um, respond and having low beta didn't, I would still put this outside the box because you didn't actually personalize dose, right? You didn't actually measure something from a person and then adjust the dose. Rather, you did some analysis after the fact. Um, uh, to suggest what would work. But of course, the value of doing that, in fact, I would say the only value of doing that is to the extent that you can learn, ah, high beta oscillations predict response. Now I'm going to update my dose instructions to say, right, wait for the high beta oscillations and then stimulate. So that's how it, how it sort of feeds in. Uh, and similarly, it, it can, for separate, separate reasons, feed into in inclusion and exclusion. Preclinical studies, biomarker-driven studies, um, they all fit in as well, because, in, in, a, in a very specific way, uh, in the extent, the precise extent that they tell us uh, how to update our technology or how to update our dose instructions, um, and they may also impact inclusion and exclusion for different reasons. When people are talking about closed loop stimulation, that's a big thing, that closed loop stimulation, the only thing that means is that this little loop of measuring a biomarker and then going around and updating the dose is done by a machine. Okay, if it's done by a machine, by computer, it's closed loop. If there's a person sitting there making those decisions, it is not closed loop. And as I already mentioned, computer modeling, it just kind of fits into everything. It doesn't change the story. I would just think of it as math that we are using to try to make this process better. Okay, so I'll conclude here. Again, I want to refer you to the uh, long article that impacts all these details and in and, and, uh, and much more specifics than I, than, I, than I could have done in this talk. I also want to refer you to this other talk, which applies all these details to specifically neuromodulation for pain. And as I mentioned, it also gets really into this, shows you through specific examples why we have to be very careful about not confusing the fact that a successful trial establishes the mechanisms. Um, thank you.